Remco is a company that services predominantly the garment trade. One division is transportation, and one division is warehousing services. Our warehouses are located in Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. As the company grew over the years, we continued to lease more and more properties across the country. And ultimately, it was a dream of mine to own our own building. We purchased a facility in Toronto, and that became our head office and one of our 3PL distribution centers. TD was there since we started the business in 1977. And, you know, over the years, uh, working closely with the bank, it uh, seemed an obvious uh, fit to not only uh, use the TD to finance the building, but also we found out that they are now in the truck financing business. The rates were quite competitive, and today we're also using them for our truck financing as well. We started with a facility that was 4,000 square feet and two trucks. Today we're operating seven facilities occupying a bit more than a million square feet across the country. As we grow the business, TD is the backbone of us being able to expand and we hope that TD will continue to be there for us. I'm Randy Cohen, President of Remco in Montreal, Quebec. Welcome to today's GNCC Naga Business Leadership Webinar with our distinguished guest, the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party, Mr. Stephen Del Duca. Stephen, thank you so very much for being with us this morning. And uh, to you, our participants, we're really glad that you could join us. My name is Mishka Bolson, and I will be your moderator for the next hour. It is so important for us to come together for conversations that collectively shape our vision. What does a successful recovery look like? How is our provincial government balancing economic and healthcare concerns? What is the role of the private sector to ensure future resilience? These are just some of the topics we're planning to discuss today. Dialogues such as this one are made possible due to the partnerships that support them. And it is my pleasure to be joined this morning by Scott Galbraith. He's the District VP for TD Commercial Banking to introduce our guest, which will be directly followed by Stephen's opening remarks, leading us into our Q&A session. And on that note, here is Scott with TD Commercial Banking. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to again have the honor of introducing today's speaker in the latest chapter of the Niagara Business Leadership Series. Thanks to Amy and Mishka and everyone at the GNCC for the continued privilege of participating in these events on behalf of TD Bank. Stephen Del Duca was first elected to the Ontario Legislature in September 2012 and had the chance to serve as Minister of Transportation and as Minister of Economic Development and Growth. In March of 2020, Stephen was elected as leader of the Ontario Liberal Party. Since becoming leader, Stephen has been focused on building an Ontario where genuine opportunity is real for everyone and where the businesses and workers across our province can thrive. Stephen, his wife, and two daughters and two dogs are proud residents of Vaughan, or as it's known in my family, the sign that means you're almost at Canada's Wonderland. Thanks everybody, welcome Stephen, and thanks again, we'll talk soon. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I am uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here uh, with all of you today for this virtual conversation. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to engage in this uh, this dialogue today. Uh, I have to say, I've, I've lived in Vaughan now for, for more than three decades, and um, uh, I love Canada's Wonderland. So that was really phenomenal in the introduction uh, that uh, the Canada's Wonderland uh, sign and presence was referenced. I appreciate that. I want to thank TD for uh, for being uh, being a sponsor today and being such an important corporate citizen, not only in Niagara region, but right across Ontario. And Mishka, I want to thank you and your team and the GNCC for uh, not only giving me this chance to be with you today, but just generally speaking for the work that you do, for the advocacy that you do. Uh, we are truly blessed uh, right across Ontario to have an extraordinarily dynamic chamber community. Uh, my time as Minister of Transportation, my time certainly, my brief time certainly as the Economic Development and Growth Minister uh, for the province, but also my time over the last 13 months or so as leader of the Ontario Liberal Party, I've really come to um, hold the chamber community, the chamber network in a very high regard for the kind of advocacy, for the kind of advice and guidance that's provided, uh, often listened to by government, not always listened to by government. Government should probably listen a little bit more. Uh, to uh, to people who uh, to who populate the chamber network and the chamber community, uh, in terms of giving the really thoughtful advice, in particular during the moment of crisis that we have all been grappling with, 
right across Ontario since uh, since February, March of 2020. So just, just a couple of things I do want to highlight in a quick moment, but I, I do want to say, um, and I know it was alluded to a second ago, I did win the leadership of the Ontario Liberal Party on Saturday, March the 7th of 2020. And I, you know, we, we had a leadership convention that took place. We had about 3,000 people in attendance from across Ontario uh, at the International Center in Mississauga. And I'm pretty sure that we were one of, if not the very last large gathering that took place in any kind of public setting before the world completely turned upside down. And I know how much of an incredible struggle the last 13 or 14 months has been, forget about for me as a politician uh, or for the Ontario Liberal Party, but for Ontarians generally speaking, in particular for some really key segments within Ontario's economy. So obviously the way that our small businesses, particularly in sectors like restaurants, tourism, hospitality, uh, have been battered so badly and so consistently throughout the pandemic has just been extremely painful to watch. And I say that as someone whose mother once owned a successful small business in the food and hospitality uh, sector at uh, Toronto St. Lawrence Market. So I had the chance when I was quite a bit younger to see firsthand how much, um, how much an individual small business entrepreneur puts into uh, owning, operating, running, and succeeding, and to know how much... Um, how much difficulty and how much disruption uh, our small businesses have gone through over the last 13, 14 months is heartbreaking. I know all levels of government have done their very best to be there. Uh, I know sometimes the information and the opportunity to access relief has been wanting, has been lacking, and it's been a real struggle, certainly from my conversations with other chambers, with the Ontario Chamber, with uh, other advocacy organizations. And that's something that I, I, I hope we'll have the chance to touch upon today in the back and forth that we're going to have. Um, but I also wanted to say, we look, we find ourselves in this, I think, very um, almost bizarre moment in the struggle against the COVID-19 pandemic. And I say that because on the one hand, we know that there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions actually, of vaccines that have already started to get deployed into people's arms. My parents have gotten theirs, my in-laws have gotten theirs. My wife is scheduled to get hers tomorrow. Uh, so on the one hand, we can see that we are, fingers crossed, we are entering into that phase when we will collectively as a people be through this struggle and that we will get to the other side, recognizing of course the tragic loss of life, the tragic loss of livelihoods and the toll that this has taken on all of us in terms of our mental health and our outlook. But at the other, the, I guess on the other hand, we see that the numbers continue to be really troubling and really, in fact, devastating. We see that Ontario's healthcare system, our ICUs are overwhelmed. Uh, there are lots of reports that have started to leak out on media in the last 20, or in media in the last 24 hours that the provincial cabinet's gonna be meeting today, that there will be new modeling coming out later today or tomorrow. Uh, we are starting to hear some pretty scary scenarios and some additional restrictions that the government of Ontario is uh, going to contemplate and perhaps announce in the next 24, to 36 hours. This is, I don't want the conversation today to be any in any way, shape or form from my side at all to be partisan, but this is a very tough moment because we are, we are closer to the end, we hope, but we still have uh, quite a bit that needs to be done. And so one of the messages uh, that I'm trying to deliver in, in all of the discussions I've been having over the last few days is, this is not the moment at which we can afford to let anything slide as a people. Uh, we really need to make sure uh, we put the partisanship aside, put everything else aside. And I say that recognizing I do have a responsibility as an opposition leader to hold Premier Doug Ford to account for decisions that I don't think are good enough. And I do that every single day. Uh, but I do want to stress, we, I hope, are only months away from being through this. And I don't want, I don't want my friends in Niagara region or rest across this province to be uh, put in, a, in, in into any rougher shape, especially given uh, how, um, how, how troubling and how dangerous the so-called variants of concern are. So um, in terms of where I think the province um, needs to be looking for, for the immediate struggle, I have grave concerns about how we have been dealing with the vaccine rollout. I've talked about these extensively in media over the last number of days, uh, but looking just a little bit beyond, even though I'm, I, again, I wanna stress that we are not through this crisis just yet, looking a little bit further beyond, I think there's some other critically important areas this might come as a, as a bit of a surprise to those on the call today. Uh, I was encouraged in the last provincial budget 
uh, the one that just was produced or announced a couple of weeks ago, uh, by a couple of things, including uh, one thing in particular I know that the Chamber Network has been calling on uh, governments to do for quite some time, and that was the large investment in broadband expansion. I think close to $3 billion that was, uh, that was provided, additional dollars provided for broadband expansion. I want you all to know, Ontario Liberals fully support that investment. Uh, it is something we know is it's important to our social cohesion as a province, but it's also really important to our economic future. And I know uh, full credit to the Chamber community for continuing to press for that. I will also say uh, the increased investment in healthcare that was included in that budget, I think is welcome news. To see, I think about a 5% growth projected in healthcare spending uh, is something that, again, coming through a healthcare crisis like we're in right now, um, it's important to have the government of the day, the current government, acknowledge that challenge and invest more in healthcare. There are some other areas where I think the budget could have gone further, should have gone further. I am gravely concerned about what I see as a foreshadowing of a cut, a significant cut to publicly funded education across this province. I have grave concerns about the current premier and government's commitment to publicly funded education. And I don't just mean elementary and secondary, although I mean that too. I'm talking about uh, you know, the calls that we've seen from the chamber and others regarding a universal or some kind of broadly expanded childcare system, which we know is a critical need, especially since we see that the level of participation of women in the workforce right now is at a historic low. And that can't, that can't be allowed to continue if we're going to have a successful and sustained economic recovery on the other side. We've seen a lot of foreshadowing from the federal government that they're budget coming up in just a few days might include something on ch child care as a bit of a centerpiece. I think that will be welcome uh, here in Ontario, certainly by me and, in Ontario, and Ontario Liberals. But I do have grave concerns about what kind of cuts to publicly funded education we're going to see, uh, including all the way through the system. So preschool, elementary, secondary, post-secondary, and lifelong, uh, lifelong learning and skills training. I think the news that we've seen coming out of Northern Ontario regarding Laurentian University has been deeply troubling because I think our post-secondary sector has also been struggling pretty brutally throughout this pandemic. And I'm concerned about what that will mean on the other side. I know again that the GNCC and others for many, many years have been talking about the need to produce the kind of uh, properly trained workforce for this province that aligns to the job opportunities and to the needs that our business owners have. I remember hearing that discussion when I served as economic development and growth minister, it's still relevant today. You can't actually fix the skills mismatch or the challenge that we have in terms of producing the workforce that we need and that you need and your members need if you're actually undermining and undervaluing and underinvesting in education at all levels. So I have some grave concerns about that. The kinds of things that Ontario Liberals truly are focused on under my leadership and I'll say just about six, seven, eight weeks ago, we launched our platform consultation process officially. We're calling it Take the Mic. That's the name of the process that we've, that's the name we've given to the process this year. Uh, you don't have to be a member of the Ontario Liberal Party to have participated in that. It's obviously going to go on as a consultation for weeks and months still to come. Uh, so I would, you know, I would encourage anybody who wants to visit OntarioLiberal.ca or TakeTheMic.OntarioLiberal.ca to go take a look at some of the feedback that we've already gotten. Um, we, I will tell you over a six, seven week window, we had about 22 or 23,000 ideas or comments come into our virtual portal, which to me is really thrilling um, and greatly encouraging. It does mean we have a lot of stuff, a lot of really cool ideas to sift through, um, including those that have come in from people who I know are a very supportive of some of the initiatives that I talked about a second ago. I will tell you, uh, and I'll finish up if you don't mind, Mishka, with this, I'll finish up by saying uh, there are four general, I'll say, themes or pillars that are very important to me in terms of our platform and ultimately in terms of how Ontario should be governed. And at the same time, there are three other um, almost, uh, you know, um, again, themes that I've asked our platform co-chairs to take into account to make sure they are they, 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 they sort of weave them their way through our entire platform, especially given what we've all had to experience and deal with or grapple with during this pandemic. The three things that I talk about an awful lot to our team, because I'm hearing this from the people of Ontario, we, we need to come up as Ontario Liberals, and frankly, again, forget the partisanship, as Ontarians, 
with a roadmap for our future that finds a way to ensure that we have the kind of security and stability that we need as a province across the board. I think we need to find or, or build a roadmap together that uh, finds a way to kind of enshrine and strengthen our resiliency as a people. Uh, and that can be resiliency as it relates to the fight against climate change and things like flood protection. It can be resiliency within our publicly funded education system. So it has the flexibility or the nimbleness to be able to transition during moments of crisis in a far better and seem more seamless way than was the case last year. Uh, it could be resiliency in terms of the kind of economy that we want to build because we are exp expanding broadband or because uh, there's no, for example, woman in this province who is held back because she doesn't have the kind of support that needs to be in place for her to be uh, a full participant in our economy. And the last thing is, I want to develop a platform and ultimately a roadmap for Ontario's future that prioritizes empathy. And, you know, when I, when I, um, was running for leader of the Ontario Liberal Party, one of the things I talked an awful lot about was economic dignity. So I'm obviously a really big believer that we have to find a way to create economic prosperity and growth. I think over the last 10 years, in particular in Ontario, we've had a really good track record at a macro level of producing that kind of prosperity and growth. I, I can still remember my talking points from my time in economic development as minister. Low, at that point, heading into 2018, lowest unemployment in nearly two decades. Uh, better economic growth than, you know, the rest of Canada, the United States, and Western Europe. This is from two, three years ago. Uh, for more than a decade, Ontario ranking first or second across all North American jurisdictions for foreign direct investment. The macro picture looked good. The macro picture in Ontario even looked good for the first year and a half or so of Doug Ford's tenure as Premier. I would say that I think that was partially because of the foundation laid by Ontario Liberals, but still it continued under Doug Ford's leadership, of course, that changed quite a bit during the pandemic. When we come out of this collectively and we're looking towards the recovery and we're building for the future, I have no doubt in Ontarians' ability as entrepreneurs, as individuals, as hardworking families, I have no doubt in our capacity and ability to build the prosperity. I just want to make sure that we are also able to produce the other half of that coin, if I can put it, which is true economic dignity. I don't want us anymore to be in a province where if you're working hard, if you and your family are playing by the rules and you're sacrificing, like my parents did when they came to this country, my dad from Italy, my mother from Scotland, when they were both 20, you know, they met here, they started their family here, they sacrificed, they worked hard, they gave me and my siblings tons of incredible opportunity. I don't want families like the one that I grew up in who are playing by the rules and are working hard to fall further and further behind. I don't want the people in this province who despite our ability to produce prosperity and despite our capacity to produce prosperity are held back. They're held back because of their gender or because of their race or their orientation. That's not good enough anymore. Now I felt these things before the pandemic but I think during this pandemic they've really been brought into sharp focus for the people of Ontario. So. I'm really looking forward to the discussion today and more importantly, the partnership that I'm hoping that I can continue to have with the GNC, GNCC and the rest of the network of chambers across this province to build the prosperity, to build the dignity, to have the best publicly funded education system in the world, to make sure we have universal public health care, including proper care for seniors that we can all rely upon and a real plan to fight the climate crisis that's an economic opportunity for the people of Ontario. Last thing, Mishka, I'm gonna say, I promise the last thing before the, before the back and forth. I served as transportation minister for three and a half years. And I loved that job. I loved being in that role. There were probably in three and a half years, three or four signature announcements that still to this day give me a very warm feeling. I will tell you that one of those announcements uh, was the day that I was uh, I was down in St. Catharines and was able to stand alongside my then colleague, your, now your regional chair, Jim Bradley, uh, to announce the long awaited and way overdue extension of GO Train service to Niagara. I just want to say that entire discussion, had it been left simply to politicians, bureaucrats, and an agency in Metrolinx, would never have occurred the way that it did. It was ultimately the advocacy of the entire region municipal leaders, the GNCC, and so many others that came together that were consistently and steadfastly in my face and pushing 
and making a very compelling argument that was uh, was able to put us into the position to make that announcement. And um, I just want you to know whether it's transportation, whether it's tourism, whatever it happens to be, if I'm elected premier next year, um, Niagara Region can count on me as an ally and a friend, and I'll do whatever I can to make sure that you're successful because your success will be Ontario's success. And with that, turn things back over to you, Mishka, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so very much for your opening remarks and especially referencing also the GO train, uh, which is close and dear to people in Niagara and who are anticipating actually some development around that in uh, the upcoming months and the year to come. But also, Stephen, wanted to uh, thank you specifically for your opening remarks when you actually referred to that we can't afford to let anything slide at this point. And I think it's really critical that at this point that we adhere to all the health guidelines that are given to us locally or by our regional uh, public health, but also by the province and the country to actually making a difference. And I really have to say that I'm proud to actually be working in Naga's business community and seeing the business support actually that has uh, been given to exactly those health guidelines, however difficult they are for businesses and they are difficult. Um, but it has been really nice to see. So thank you for making those remarks. And we do agree with you uh, when it comes to broadband, uh, looking at the region and the way the region is set up, that the broadband investment is critical, especially as the workforce and as we're moving forward, it will likely look differently than what we have seen in the past with more people being able to work from home. And often recessions also create a lot of entrepreneurship, uh, which often starts in people's home on a smaller scale. So we're really glad uh, to see that part of it too. For today's uh, chat and the question and answer, there's a high number of questions that have come to us. So I'm trying to get to some of them, but I'm also encouraging our participants to utilize either the hand function or the chat function. I don't need to explain it anymore. I think all of us know how they work by now, um, but please utilize them. We can see the chat and the questions coming in and we'll try and are committed to get to most of them. And Stephen, on that note, let me start with one critical issue, and that is the lack of affordable housing that has become a critical issue, not just in Niagara, but across the province and in many ways actually across the country. What role can the provincial government play in relieving this problem, and how would the Liberal government go about solving it? No, I, that's a fantastic question to start with, and I, I will tell you, I, I wish that I had the easy answer. Uh, or the magic wand that would that would make this uh, that would help solve this challenge. I I can still remember uh, four or five, maybe even now six years ago, being in the cabinet room and engaging in a conversation with my colleagues at that point in time. And, and back then, so this would have been 2000 and I'll say 15, 2016. It was a problem. It was starting to emerge as a significant challenge, particularly in at that point GTA maybe even a little bit of the GTHA. Sorry, I have dogs and then somebody just rang the doorbell and so you're hearing my dogs bark, my apologies. Um, so I will just I, I will just say that uh, maybe they don't like my answer, that's why they're barking. But anyway. So, my um, will start in a second too, <laughs> so hearing your dog barking. <laughs> so, so what's happened over the last, you know, since then, over the two years, four years, six years that have passed, is that the problem that was somewhat isolated in the GTA, somewhat, has continued, Mishka, to your point, it's grown. And you know now, well, frankly, when I was running for leader uh, more than a year ago, there was almost no part of Ontario, with a couple of exceptions, where I wasn't hearing more and more. And this is pre-pandemic. So when you look at what housing prices have done during the pandemic across the Golden Horseshoe and beyond, it's just the growth in prices has been exponential. I think that, you know, I definitely believe that there is a, a significant role government needs to play in order to set the conditions for greater success in this regard, more housing affordability. I think there's need for, there, there will continue to be a need for direct intervention from federal, provincial and municipal governments in creating spaces in particular for those, whether they come from the disabled community or you know, elsewhere who really need that, that helping hand. But beyond that, for, you know, for, for, for everyone else who's out there who's just looking for their opportunity to crack into the market, and by the way, this has impacted the rental housing market as well, one of the big challenges that I think we have in the Golden Horseshoe and beyond relates to, uh, relates to supply and supply of all types. Now, what I call for while running for leader, what I continue to call for, and this was part of our the initial stage of our, of our platform process was, I think it's really bizarre that in the year 2021, we don't have any real uh, centralized 
analysis that helps to measure or benchmark what the approvals process is, whether we're talking about municipalities, whether we're talking about some of the other, uh, some of the other um, constituent parts of the approvals process to take a housing concept from, from concept all the way to shovels in the ground, all the way to actually producing, whether it's, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, whatever kind of housing it is. And I've been calling for this for a number of years. Let's just benchmark it because I'm convinced that, you know, despite really good intentions, we have inadvertently helped create some of the inflation in the market uh, because supply doesn't move as quickly as it needs to for all forms of housing. Uh, and so as a first step, I would like to make sure that we, we are protecting what we need to protect with the approvals process that at the same time is also advanced enough and efficient enough to take the concept from literally the drawing board to actually giving a family or an individual the chance to own or rent their own home in a reasonable time frame. You all know this better than I do. Time is money. And every single time, particularly around transit lines, particularly around other areas where there's room and space and interest to intensify or to build to provide the kind of housing stock that we need, when it takes four years, eight years, 12 years to actually produce the outcome, you know, ultimately the end user, the customer is the one who's going to pay that freight. And I think that's a real problem in Ontario. And I don't think anyone's ever looked at it holistically. I don't think municipalities can do it on their own. I think it really should be the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, whether through the Growth Secretariat or some other, some other arm of government that actually takes that into account, measures it properly, and then figures out how to actually solve what I think is still too much, um, you know, too slow on, on the approval side. I think when you speak to it being too slow, I think this uh, kind of mirrors what a lot of people are feeling. We have within our uh, chamber a council that is an advisory council to us. It's called the Next Naga, they're emerging leaders. And they are really a young group of uh, people, 35 and younger, many of them actually wanting to enter this marketplace. And yeah. it, just the difficulty that they're experiencing and the stress that it creates is uh, actually quite extraordinary actually to observe at the same time. And then we talk to businesses on the other hand who are wanting to attract a skilled labor Labor, but you can attract skilled labor, but you have to house them and you have to give yeah. them opportunities actually for it. There are so many facets that are linked to housing um, and that issue um, that I think it's really when we look at it from a Niagara perspective and from what we're hearing from the community, it's one of our key issues uh, that is here. But I'm trying to get to a couple of other smaller ones, but big ones in actually they're they're all big ones actually. So let's let me we have been joined today by the number of wineries um, and breweries, and that's really a, a sector that has critically defined uh, and redefined our tourism in Niagara and uh, the whole industry as a whole. And they are keen to see the demolition of interprovincial trade barriers, especially to all beverage uh, alcohol sales that are there. Now that the government of Canada has opened the door to the provinces, how would you address this issue? So when, when um, last summer, when the COVID cases, um, thank goodness at that point in time had come down quite a bit, I, uh, I started to tour again. It's obviously been tough as a political leader to tour over the last 13 months because you know we, we have to be safe, we have to be responsible. All of us have to be following the public health guidelines. But there was a window, it might have been August, it might have been September, where I was back on the road and, and on more than one occasion, two occasions in particular, I was in Niagara and I did have a chance to um, meet with some, uh, some, uh, some industry reps from the, from the wine industry and the grape growing industry and I had a really fascinating conversation. My time at economic development and growth was only about five months. I didn't have that much of an opportunity in those five months, the last five months that Ontario Liberals were in power to have a lot of um, full on conversations with the industry. But when I was there, as I was saying, late last summer and in early into the fall, I did hear about the need to reduce interprovincial trade barriers and that there were a series of other, I mean, I'm gonna call them regulatory, um, almost re regulatory, uh, what's the right word, disturbances. And I don't wanna undersell it. I don't wanna under, under, uh, undervalue how troubling they are about the way that we deal with the, with the wine industry and the grape growing industry in Ontario that doesn't take place in the same way in places like British Columbia. 
So in any event, when we when we came up with our initial platform consultation and the, the first five or six weeks on our take the mic process, I talked about the reduction, because I do believe in the reduction or the elimination of the inter interprovincial trade barriers. But I'm look, I'm running to be Premier of Ontario. And what I want us to do uh, if I become Premier as government here is to find a way to be unapologetically um, pursuing at all times and I hate to use this phrase, this this phrasing, because I think it's been kind of morphed and twisted. But I, I it twisted by many others outside of Ontario. I really want us to be unapologetically Ontario first in how we're competing and how we're selling to the rest of our country, and frankly, even beyond the rest of our country. And I find that there are so many different ways that you know there are so many good ways that Ontario historically has been to use the phrasing a bit of a boy scout, a bit of a, you know, a good student. We're always a good citizen. We always want everyone to do well. And that's, that's part of our innate nature as Ontarians, which is phenomenal. We should be proud of that. But I think very often we, we end up taking it on the chin economically while others are kind of racing ahead and doing what needs to be done. So as it relates to wine, as it relates to the entire ecosystem built up around wine, I am a strong supporter in the reduction or elimination of the interprovincial trade barriers. But I think it needs to be even more muscular than that. I think we have to continue to push. Uh, we have to continue to be almost a little bit unlike what Ontario's always been in this regard. Not get our elbows up in an angry way. We're, we are all Canadians after all, but we have to stop being, we have to stop having this inadvertent inferiority complex about how much we can accomplish if we actually take a more, I call it a more muscular approach on this stuff. And so to me, it's an attitudinal, almost cultural thing that we need to really get over. And I think if we do that successfully, it will benefit Niagara's, uh, Niagara's Ontario's wine industry and Ontario's grape growing industry. And that's what I'm keen to deliver on. And Stephen, I think it's something that we really have almost asked the private sector to do during this crisis, to make bold exactly. decisions, to make fast decisions and to move forward. And I have been so encouraged to seeing that, how they pivoted, how their business model has changed, how they have adapted to the current environment and to see it mirrored in the public sector i think it's something that would be really welcome from the private sector and so even the speed at which some decisions have been made have been really encouraging to see collaboration is another key one it's it's really it's really encouraging to see but um i'm going to pass it on to one of our participants here who has raised her hand her name is ruth Unra, who is a strong voice for gender equity in niagara and on that note, I'm going to have uh, Ruth ask her question. Ruth, over to you. Thank you, Mishka. And thank you very much for being here with us today, Mr. Del Duca. Um, it's really an honor to listen to you. Um, we are very concerned about the state of child care. And you mentioned it earlier in your, in your opening remarks. And Mishka talked about the next Niagara Council um, with the Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce. And you know, we talk about housing, but also access to quality and affordable childcare is a big issue for us. Niagara is especially hard hit when it comes to women in the labor force because of the nature of the, uh, of the industry we have here in terms of hospitality and, and the service sector. And one of the big concerns is um, educated ECEs that, um, and we, they're, they're you know, poorly paid, so there's an issue there, CERB comes out, they don't go back to work. So we have childcare spaces open to us, but we don't necessarily have the early childhood education educators. So I'm wondering about what your policy would be around getting more people educated and, and the uh, like a living wage for those people as well. Typically they're making around $17 an hour and that's with a wage subsidy. Yeah. Listen, that's that's a great question, Ruth, and I really appreciate it. I, I would say a couple of things. One is I, I really do believe that the federal budget coming out on April the 19th, I mean, I think the federal finance minister and the federal government, <clears throat> excuse me, could not have been any more clear in terms of their own foreshadowing. I do believe the centerpiece of the, the federal budget is going to be some kind of, I'm hoping, very strong national framework with funding attached um, to help the provinces and territories uh, that need the help like we do here in Ontario to create a real um, a real childcare system that's affordable, that's accessible, that has the spaces available right around the province and also the staff who are qualified and paid properly, as you said a second ago, um, they're, uh, they're in the system. So that's what I'm looking forward to seeing with my fingers crossed. 
I am a little bit concerned about um, how it will be proposed to be delivered because of course, provincial governments, territorial governments would be under normal circumstances would be the deliverers, uh, you know, again, working with the private sector, NGOs, even municipalities on, on terms of delivering on, on the vision. And this is where in Ontario's case, we've, in Canada's case, historically, we've kind of run into some hiccups along the way, because there obviously are lots of different philosophical perspectives on how childcare should be provided. So I will tell you, I think in the next few weeks on the other side of the federal budget, Ontario Liberals will have something specific to say about childcare and what that needs to look like. Um, but I think the other point you raised around the, the pay and the compensation for ECEs, whether or not we have enough in the system, and clearly we don't in Niagara and elsewhere, I think that goes back to what I said in my opening remarks relating to the education system and the training system and our post-secondary um, uh, ecosystem in Ontario and you know what are who are we producing? What are we producing? What professions are being pursued? So whether it's ECEs, and I by the way, I've heard what you've just described to me, I've heard from many others in different parts of the province. We have a similar problem or deficit with personal support workers and long-term care and home care. You know, again, during this pandemic, there's been a really bright light that has been shone into different professions and vocations that people historically have done that are so critically important that are not properly valued, uh, that are not properly compensated. Um, and it's really hard to attract talent when the job is tough, it's not particularly rewarding, and it doesn't pay you very well. I mean, it's really hard to ask a young person, let's say for argument's sake, come be an ECE, come be a PSW, come be something else. We need you. Our economy can't, you know, our society, our economy can't perform properly without you, but you know, your pay is going to be yeah, so so or or not not even so so bad. And your ability to land a job and stay in the job is going to be tough as well. So I think it, it's a, it's time for a reorientation uh, along the lines of the economic dignity piece that I talked about earlier today. Um, so looking at those positions, making sure they are properly they are properly paid, and then using that elevation of the profession or vocation to attract more women and men into uh, the profession or vocation, I think is the best way to go. And that's something that I would be keen to work on and to prioritize if I become premier. Thank you very much. And actually, just while we're on this topic of it, because it really does relate to uh, uh, a skilled labor force, but it also relates to education. We have been joined by Mark Nantel, who is with Naga College. Um, both actually, we've been joined by Brock University as well, two extraordinary post-secondary uh, institutions who have a tremendous economic impact on Niagara and uh, are supporting the businesses and industries that are here. But Mark's question is, um, if we can get your position on the current exercise by the Ontario government to move from mostly enrollment based to mostly performance based funding for colleges and universities, would you continue this trend or would you do something different? So, I mean, if you heard if you heard my remarks in the opening today and even what I how I responded to Ruth a second ago, I think it's evident that I do believe I do believe we have to be more deliberate in our post secondary system about nudging, encouraging, nudging, kind of prodding in a way, uh, both the system and the institutions and then the individual students and their families to make sure that we are aligning how much we invest in post-secondary, which is, which is good, but not enough, by the way, Need, more needs to be done there too. Um, you know, when, when we take that investment, by the way, the investment government makes, the investment the institution makes, the investment the student makes, we need to be able to drive towards better outcomes because I, I got to tell you, again, from my time as Minister of Economic Development and Growth and as leader, three years later, I still hear in every part of Ontario, in virtually every sector, from employers who say, Stephen, if there were 60x engineers, uh, PSWs, whatever the right profession is, a uh, tool and die, cybersecurity, uh, biotech, whatever it is. I was on a call yesterday with uh, with one of Ontario's leading uh, sort of tech um, uh, tech incubators, if I can put it that way. And every single CEO on the call was uh, was in, in great detail, painfully explaining to me how they have job postings and they want to fill those jobs, but they can't find people uh, who are prepared to stay here. So uh, to learn here, to stay here, to settle here, and to work for them. So anyway. This is a refrain I've been hearing for some time. And, 
as a political leader, I keep asking myself, how do we miss the mark? You know, how do we keep doing this? Like everybody recognizes it's a challenge. So surely there has to be a better way. So do I know for certain that the way that the current premier and government's pursuing the funding model is the right way to go? My answer is no, I don't know for sure that that's right. I don't know that I trust the degree to which they did their dialogue or their consultation with the system um, to get the kind of ideas that will actually work. I found in my time in provincial government, very often, even the best or most well-intentioned ideas ended up losing an awful lot in translation, if I can put it that way, when they were deployed out into the real world. I think one of the best ways to guard against that is to do proper consultation. And I will also say in the, in the most nonpartisan way possible, when it comes to education period, preschool, elementary, secondary, post-secondary and lifelong, I just don't actually trust uh, the current government to deliver the way that we need them to deliver. I am nervous um, that every single exercise that seems like it's a um, positive forward looking realignment is actually a thinly veiled attempt to cut costs. And I will tell you the most important economic policy we have as a province is how we invest in education, education at all levels, including the lifelong skills piece. If we're missing that in this province, we cannot compete. And I'm not quite sure, in fact, I am quite sure, sorry, it's gonna sound partisan, I don't believe Doug Ford gets that piece. I don't think he sees that is the missing ingredient um, or that is the most essential ingredient for Ontario to, to, you know, to have the economy that we all want it to have. I wonder when, when this, and I fully agree, so many things that you're saying, but I'm wondering when how to guard against some of the problems that we have. Is the root of the problem maybe also the silos in which we function in? So here I'm a chamber, so we're promoting, you know, the business interests uh, that are there. Um, but I think businesses often have really been forced to lower the silos between their own departments within bigger companies and organizations. Um, when we look at the problems and the issues that we have, education, skilled labor, you look at childcare, you look at healthcare, it's an integrated, it's a net um, that is interdependent on, its, each, on the other. And we've learned something in our pandemic is that we, our healthcare impacts our economy, you know, and we might have not looked at it beforehand like this. It's an opportunity for government to saying that, what do we do to break down some of those silos that are existing? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll go a step further. I think, I, think the current, I think the current model that we have, and I'll only speak about provincial government, though I know it's similar at the other two levels as well. I think the current model that we have is, again, well-intentioned. I think there was a, there, there's always been a very small C conservative design to Canadian government. And I think that's been largely because, you know, as part of our organizational DNA, we're trying to, we're trying to reduce risk. And we're trying to make sure that there are enough safeguards built in to you know, how we perform as a society through government. And that's a good thing. Obviously, in, in all of your businesses and all of the members you have, you would want to reduce risk to the, to the extent that it's ne necessary. But when that small C conservative, so that's not a partisan comment at all, when that, when that, um, when that focus on risk reduction or risk elim elimination <clears throat> actually um, eliminates innovation and creativity, and um, people's imagination, then I think you the pendulum has swung too far. And I will tell you, serving in government, even as a cabinet minister, it used to drive me crazy. I'm a pretty, I'm pretty impatient for progress as a human being, and I it used to just drive me crazy that there were so many different layers and steps and approvals that needed to be accomplished, and you know people just ragging the puck all the time. And I don't think in retrospect, it was, it was, um, I don't think it was malice. I just think it's the way the crust, the layers of crust have been um, managed to sort of, they've managed to build up through many, many decades. In any event, you're right, Mishka, that the, the, the pandemic has shown us that when you face the ultimate crisis, the existential threat, you can actually push and pull the levers quicker than you ever imagined would be the case uh, during normal times. So I don't want us to continue to have to suffer through any kind of crisis, but we should be able to take the lessons that have been learned through this crisis and say, how do we take the best of what we learned and apply it to what we're gonna do going forward? And I, I think there's definitely space there. My fear is that government being what government is, 
and I have a ton of respect, obviously, for government, I'm running to be Premier of Ontario, that it will be comfortable uh, to fall back into conventional patterns because that's just the way that it's always been done. A phrase that I hate, by the way, um, that it's just the way that it's always been done. So let's be comfortable. Let's be secure in our knowledge. We can just go back to the normal way of doing things. I, I don't want that either. Um, I just have to, I got to believe there's a, there's a better balance between reducing risk, but encouraging the innovation and the ingenuity and the creativity. Yeah, we fully agree. And I think this is something that we hear from our business members and other organizations that are part of us too, is that we, we don't want the old to normal back. Many of us don't. We want to redefine of what the normal could look like uh, and taking into consideration the economic, the social and the environmental best for all people that are here. So it's just a, it's a different approach and it's a different lens at which we actually look at policies and aspects of it. And on that note, um, there is, what would your government or how would your government approach protecting prime agricultural land? And uh, particularly also when we look at the green belt areas uh, surrounding the GTHA, um, there have been um, a number of changes to some of the minister zoning orders that are also necessary uh, to ensure province-wide policy objectives are being met in specific circumstances. But we're seeing a lot of discussion around that, and it's yeah. critical to Niagara as well. And uh, Stephen. Um, it's hard to ask a politician to be sure, but I'm aware that we only have 10 minutes left and there's another two or three questions we want to get to, but so maybe I'll ask for it. <laughs> I appreciate your gentle way of saying, come on, Del Duca, keep them shorter. Okay, I promise I'll try. I am obviously, I'm a proud liberal and it was the Ontario Liberal government of one of my predecessors who delivered on the Green Belt. I believe the Green Belt is sacrosanct. I think it's one of the key features of how we chose as a people to protect our green space and to protect our, our, our drinking water and to preserve it for future generations. So I am gravely concerned about how this current government has used the MZO tool. I say that recognizing that within our system, MZOs, they, MZOs have a well-intentioned use as a tool of absolute last resort, uh, absolute last resort. What Doug Ford has done with MZOs under the cover of a pandemic is to use them as a weapon of first resort not as a tool of last resort. And that's where they've gotten it wrong. Um, I will not spend any time on this call casting aspersions as to their motives. Uh, there's been enough published about that in media, but I will tell you that a number of weeks ago, I made a commitment that if elected leader of uh, this province next year, a highway 413, otherwise known as the GTA West corridor, a project that I stopped the first time when I was transportation minister would be a project that I would not proceed with, that I would actually kill once and for all. Um, I don't believe the, the benefit of spending 10 plus billion dollars on that particular highway uh, makes a lot of sense given what the independent report that, that I commissioned um, would show in terms of time savings, while at the same time paving over parts of the green belt, destroying farmland and negatively impacting significant, uh, provincially significant wetlands. So MZOs should only be used in a very prescribed way as a tool of last resort not that weapon of first resort. I believe the green belt is sacrosanct. And I believe there's a way to build critically needed infrastructure in a way that makes sense uh, in a, in a, in a, and, uh, and using the kind of investment in a way that makes sense, including for Niagara region. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it is an important topic uh, and it's very much top of mind uh, for many for many of us actually across Ontario. But uh, we have a couple of attendees and they have uh, asked similar questions. They're related to a living wage and to basic income. Uh, two topics that also have been very prevalent during this pandemic as we're trying to support um, everyone actually uh, across the country. What are your thoughts and what are your party's thoughts on those? So again, I was part of a government that launched the, the uh, what was supposed to be a three-year basic income pilot. Uh, Doug Ford had committed to keep the pilot in place while running for premier, then canceled it. I think when you look back now and you look at the federal program around CERB and a lot of the other calls that we've seen for that basic floor of support, I, I suspect many inside the current Ontario government probably regret the premature cancellation of the basic income pilot because by now, by the time that the pandemic struck, we would have had the data back as a province to be able to look at what the benefits were, what the costs were, did it make sense to proceed? And all of that was lost. So what I committed to while running for leader was that at the very least, I would reinstate the basic income pilot so that we as a government would be able, and as a people would have a full 
the full range of options in front of us to make a decision with proper research about how best to go forward. Some on the call might not know that uh, recently in British Columbia, their provincial government commissioned a very exhaustive panel report on the issue of income supports, including a basic income. Uh, they came back and suggested in their report that a universal basic income would probably not be the best way to achieve what those who champion it uh, want to achieve. Instead, they've called for the creation of targeted basic income supports, for example, with people with disabilities or developmental challenges. I think that's one of the things that we will take a look at, trying to target the supports where they make the most sense, while at the same time reinstating the basic income pilot so we have all of the research available to us to make a fully informed decision going forward. Yeah, we would appreciate that. We believe actually uh, currently, and we hear the same from business, that there's just a lack of data and information actually that is available. Um, right. And it's a very complex issue too. Uh, yeah. Again, and it, it breaks out of one silo into a number of others. Um, we are Niagara here, and Niagara has been defined because of uh, tourism uh, and uh, our accommodation, the experiences that people can have. We have up to 12 to 14 million visitors uh, in a normal year coming to Niagara, enjoying Niagara that's here from across the world. And the sector has been devastated by this. Do you look at, you're looking at what uh, is being offered currently federally and provincially to the accommodation and food services sector. Is everything being done or do we need to do more to uh, ensure a safe recovery and reopening of the economy? So I think that, I think that there's a lot that has been talked about and even I'll say a lot that's been done. I think it's been in many cases been, um, difficult for people to access and navigate the support programs that have been offered by levels of government, both levels of government. That's been, I think, really problematic. One of the things I do hear frequently from um, business owners in, in the tourism and hospitality sectors is the, you know, how are we gonna contend with how much debt we've accumulated through the pandemic for a lot of the things that we couldn't get relief for or we couldn't get enough relief for so let's just assume a perfect world. We get through, the numbers come back down over the, the second half of this year, things start to reopen, including, and I know this is important for Niagara, the Canada-US border when it's safe, when it's safe to do so and people decide it should be opened. When we can actually make a go of it again, we know in Niagara and beyond that we can compete, we're good. But if we've got this massive hangover, debt hangover from the pandemic, it's like an anchor around us. So I think there, I'd be interested to have a conversation about what, what additional steps can be taken by government to help deal with either extending the runway or softening the runway around pandemic related accumulated debt. So that, you know, and again, no easy solutions here, no cheap solutions either, but I'd want to give our sector, our, our tourism and hospitality sector, the very best opportunity to thrive once again, rather than having the pandemic stop in 2021 but the economic hangover in those sectors last three, four or five years longer is just not a good story for anybody, in particular those who've been directly impacted. And uh, I wasn't going to bring up, but, but you mentioned the public uh, debt that's there and it is troublesome, especially for businesses when we look at it. How do we balance the needs of Ontarians uh, that are there right now and that ever increasing burden provincially and federally of debt that is there? Um, what are your initiatives there? What are your, like, what is your focus and your commitment towards a more balanced budget, towards reducing the debt, especially when we look at how much it actually costs us on a monthly basis? So, I mean, throughout my political life, I've been regarded, and it's accurate as a, I call it a, you know, a fiscally responsible, pragmatic Ontario liberal. It's, um, you know, I, and I, and I'm proud of that. I, it's what I believe in. I believe in um, you know, yes, making significant investments in those core things that are critically important for our collective success, but I also know nobody wants their hard earned tax dollars to be wasted. And so I think government always does have to do its best to be responsible. The challenge coming through the pandemic, and I'll only talk about the province of Ontario, the challenge is that this is, this is not the time, and I don't believe for the next number of years, uh, will there be either an appetite or uh, will, it be, um, will it be smart uh, for us to take any deep kind of austerity measures to get back to some 
I'll even say kind of arbitrarily picked point in the future to say, here, here's when we're going to be back at a balanced budget. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be pursuing a balanced budget. I just don't think we're going to be able to successfully get there by issuing deep and dramatic cuts or, or any kind of austerity. There are a couple of things I think we can do. Um, I do believe that one of the most important ways to get us back to some semblance of balance will be around growth. So when I talk about investing, supporting the broadband expansion, when I talk about investing in education, to me, those are not, that's not telecommunications policy or education policy. Again, that's, that's, employ that's economic policy. Uh, you know, a childcare system that's affordable and accessible, that's economic policy. So the, one is the growth. Secondly, in areas like healthcare, I, there has to be a very frank conversation with our federal government. I think at last count, the federal government pays about 22 or 23 percent of the share of healthcare costs in the province of Ontario. Premiers, including Doug Ford, have asked them to take that number to 35 percent. Of course, I support that call, but I'm also a realist. The federal government has a massive deficit to deal with right now, too. They're not going to turn it from 23 percent to 35 percent overnight. But I do think there needs to be a very frank conversation with our federal government about restructuring. I call it the architecture of our fiscal federalism, because I don't think it's appropriate anymore in something as critically important as healthcare to have the province on the hook for 78%, 77%, and the feds who have the greater capacity, especially on the monetary side, to be able to say, we're going to get away with 22%, 23%, while we're calling for better standards. Yeah, That doesn't work to me. So anyway, I think there's there's more that can be done there combined with economic growth. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, that's good. Any closing comments? I'm conscious of the time. It's 1230. You're committed to an hour. Any closing comments you would like to make? Now, listen, I just want to thank all of you again, Mishka, you in particular for moderating and inviting and giving me this chance. I am, I am very much looking forward once we've gotten through this next really uh, tough number of weeks um, to being back in Niagara and having the chance to meet with uh, hopefully many, if not all of you, when it's safe and responsible to do so. Uh, I, I'm a big champion of Niagara. I'll continue to be a champion for Niagara. And I want you to know, maybe I'll ask my chief of staff to type my email address into the chat feature. It's Stephen at, Stephen with a V, at OntarioLiberal.ca. Uh, nice and easy. Please reach out to me if you have any other questions, advice, or guidance, or you want to tell me I'm doing something wrong, that's fine too. And I'm really looking forward to, again, uh, getting through this, this crisis and being back with all of you again soon. Thank you so much and please stay safe and healthy. Yeah, Stephen, thank you so very much for being with us. It was a really valuable uh, dialogue to all of us. This today's uh, webinar has been taped and recorded and we will share it with all of our participants at the same time. Um, also, I would like to extend my thanks to TD Commercial Banking for actually making today's uh, conversation possible at the same time. My colleague at the Ontario Chamber of Commerce always ends by saying stay positive and test negative and that seems somehow appropriate at this time and above all stay safe. So thank you for being with us and all the best.